Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing chronic gastritis and peptic ulcers. Okay, so we've just been discussing the fact that uh, in chronic gastritis, the most common cause of chronic gastritis is uh, infection with this bacterium Helicobacter pylori. Uh, which colonizes the mucus which lines the surface of the stomach, okay? And we've discussed the factors which allow Helicobacter pylori to successfully colonize uh, the stomach lining. Okay, now what we want to discuss is what the um, body's response to this is, because basically it doesn't welcome it, okay? So it launches an immune response against it. It launches the acute inflammatory response. The problem is that the acute inflammatory response fails to clear it, okay? So what happens in the acute inflammatory response? We can at least discuss that. Well, basically, the acute inflammatory response is marked uh, by a large neutrophil infiltration, okay, specifically into the lamina propria. So basically you end up with a large number of neutrophils in the lamina propria. Now let me just discuss uh, neutrophils. Okay, so neutrophils, if you like, are the pawns of the immune system. They are uh, a quite cheap cell, okay? So they are not particularly strong, but you have a large number of them, okay? So you can just sort of send them in and not worry about losing a few, which is why I compare them to the pawns in chess, okay? Now, they have other names as well. They're also called polymorphonuclear cells. Okay, so polymorphonuclear cells, and polymorphonuclear cells can be converted into polymorphonucleosites. Okay, so a similar name, uh, but for the re but for this reason, their name can be called polymorphonucleosites. They can also be abbreviated to PMNs for short. P for poly, M for morpho, and then N for nucleosites. Okay, so it's quite common to see um, neutrophils called PNNs. In addition, one final little name is that they can just be called polymorphs. Okay, now let me show you the structure of a neutrophil, uh, and then we'll discuss what they do. Okay, so the characteristic feature of neutrophils is that, is that they have a multi-lobe nucleus that can take many different structures, basically, hence the polymorphonuclear. Okay, now the archetypal uh, number of lobes for a neutrophil nucleus to have is three. Okay, so I want to stress that the neutrophil does not have multiple nuclei. Uh, this is the same nucleus, it's just got a bizarre shape, basically. You've got these lobes with little thin tubes in between them, basically. And it's not always free. Some of them will have four, or maybe even five, and that's why they're called polymorphonuclear cells. Poly means many, morpho means shape, nucleus. So many shaped nuclei. Okay, right. And this type of cell basically is a phagocyte. So what it will do is it will go over to invading pathogenic uh, entities. It will phagocytose them, okay? So take them into a phagosome uh, within its cytoplasm. So here we have the pathogen within the uh, phagosome, and I will just colour in the pathogen in vivid purple here. And basically what will then happen is the uh, neutrophil also has special little vesicles called lysosomes here, okay? All cells have lysosomes, but the neutrophil will make especially good use of it. And basically, these lysosomes are full of enzymes called lysozymes, uh, which are basically just enzymes which will well, many different enzymes, for instance, proteases, uh, which will break down uh, the contents of the phagosome here. So the vesicle within which the um, pathogen is taken up is called a phagosome. And basically, these lysosomes will now fuse with the phagosome and release the lysozymes onto the uh, pathogen within the phagosome, and the pathogen will be broken down, it will be digested. So, uh, this seems like a good idea. We'll throw neutrophils out there and hope for the best, hope that they can phagocytose some of these Helicobacter uh, pylori bacteria. Okay, so what you end up with then 
is the lamina propria gets a huge number of these neutrophils within it. So you'll see many, many neutrophils within the lamina propria. Some of them even do manage to cross the basement membrane and uh, end up on the uh, epithelial side, basically. Okay, and these are known as intraepithelial um, and neutrophils. Okay, so I'll write that keyword down. So some of them actually do get to an intraepithelial location where they are then capable of uh, phagocytosing the Helicobacter pylori. And it's very important that they actually do get to this intraepithelial location because Helicobacter pylori doesn't actually invade into the mucosa. It stays on the surface of the mucosa. You might think the bacterium would be tempted to, you know, come down and live in this lamina propria here, but it doesn't. It's confined and stays within the mucus. Now, that makes it quite difficult for the immune system to get to it. Uh, so, uh, it chucks neutrophils into the lamina propria, but then there's no point of the neutrophils being in the lamina propria because there's no helicobacter pylori in the lamina propria. So, the neutrophils have to then somehow negotiate their way across the basement membrane to get to an intraepithelial location, and then they can start working on the helicobacter pylori. So, clearing this infection is fought with problems, basically. And needless to say, it fails. You, you don't clear the infection in most cases, okay? And um, what also happens is the stomach also starts to increase its secretion of hydrochloric acid, okay? So the stomach's usual way of dealing with bacteria is to um, burn them, basically, is to um, douse them with hydrochloric acid, and that's intolerable to life, basically, so it kills the cell. Okay, so the stomach's response to this infection with the Helicobacter pylori is to increase hydrochloric acid secretion. Okay, and this again, fails to, to clear the Helicobacter pylori infection, because remember, the Helicobacter pylori is very clever. It's not just living on the surface of the mucus, it's within the mucus, okay? The mucus contains lots of bicarbonate anions and is protecting the Helicobacter pylori from the hydrochloric acid, even when the stomach secretes more. Uh, it's, the, you know, the Helicobacter pylori remains protected. It's also got its urease enzymes, which are making ammonia, which is also a base, and therefore is also mopping up these free protons and protecting the Helicobacter pylori cells from uh, the hydrochloric acid. Okay, and so the hydrochloric acid fails to clear the Helicobacter pylori infection and actually does more damage than good, basically. So the stomach clearly hasn't heard the expression, you can't fight fire with fire, because basically it's attempting to fight uh, fire with fire here. It's become a monster in trying to kill a monster, okay? So there's my little political message from this uh, video. So not only am I educating you on science, I'm also educating you on um, politics. You can't fight fire with fire, and when fighting a monster, you must make sure that you don't become a monster. Okay, so, um, basically what happens now is that this increase in hydrochloric acid secretion by the wall of the stomach is going to trigger a peptic ulcer. Okay, so now what we're moving on to is the pathology of a peptic ulcer. Okay, now the difference between a peptic ulcer and a acute gastric ulcer is that an acute gastric ulcer is acute, whereas a peptic ulcer is a chronic ulceration of the stomach wall. Now, I should just stress that peptic ulcers, you can have uh, peptic ulcers within the duodenum, and they're far more common actually within the duodenum than they are within the stomach. We are discussing stomach peptic ulcers here. Okay, so what's going to happen is this increased uh, production of hydrochloric acid is basically going to corrode the mucosa of the stomach. Okay, so you're going to get large um, ulcers 
which just means basically a hole in the mucosa, okay? So let me show this. So basically, before we showed the uh, mucosa like so, so we had this gastric pit and then we had the gastric glands coming down like this. And remember, the mucosa consisted of the epithelial cells with a basement membrane and then with the lamina propria and the muscularis mucosae underneath. Now, basically, we're going to have maybe a large hole here where the epithelium has just been burnt away, the basement membrane has been digested as well, and um, all of this lamina propria has been cleared here. This is an ulcer. Now, in an acute gastric ulcer, which is the same concept, it's the same concept that you're burning a hole in the uh, wall of the stomach, basically. Um, but in an acute gastric ulcer, the cause of the ulceration is temporary, okay? So it's, it stops, okay? So maybe you take uh, an NSAID, okay? So you might take aspirin, okay? And it might trigger uh, a gastric ulcer like so. Or maybe you have some intracranial injury which results in uh, over-secretion of uh, hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells, but it's temporary. And that burns uh, a few little holes in the mucosa which causes pain at the time. It will cause uh, abdominal discomfort, it might cause nausea, it might cause vomiting, it may, if severe, cause gastric bleeding. But uh, after the cause is removed, uh, basically the mucosa can heal completely. That's the fantastic thing about the stomach mucosa. It can heal itself. It has good capacity for regeneration. And then that's it. The problem with peptic ulcers is that the Helicobacter pylori is going nowhere. The stomach does not learn that its attempt to kill the Helicobacter pylori by uh, secreting more hydrochloric acid is not working, so it continues it for a long period of time. So basically, the damaging stimulus is not removed this time, and basically these ulcers will not be healed. They will not get the opportunity to heal because the hydrochloric acid will just continuously burn away, basically. Okay, so you have these chronic uh, ulcers, and that is the concept of a peptic ulcer, when you've got these chronic ulcerations to the mucosa. Okay, right. Now, uh, what are the complications of chronic uh, ulcerations to the stomach wall? Well, basically, you can often get gastric bleeding, okay? So, um, basically, if this uh, mucosa tries to heal, Okay, it will often grow a whole new bunch of new blood vessels in that process. And then if the hydrochloric acid then burns away at this granulation tissue, what will then happen is these blood vessels will be exposed into the lumen of the stomach and they can then hemorrhage into the stomach. So you can get gastric bleeding and this can be extremely uh, serious. It can be life-threatening. So you can actually lose so much blood into the stomach that it can become life-threatening threatening, okay? So this is very, very serious. In addition, even worse, sometimes what can actually happen is the hydrochloric acid can burn through. And also, I should mention, it's not just the hydrochloric acid. It's also uh, the proteases which are in the stomach, because those digest proteins. Okay, so not only the hydrochloric acid, but the proteases, they can actually make their way through the entire stomach wall. So usually, uh, thank God, uh, gastric ulcers are generally restricted to the mucosa. So the epithelial layer, the basement membrane, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosae. Okay, but if they make their way through layers underneath, so if they get through the submucosa, then through the um, muscularis propria, and then through the serosa, then they can actually leak into the peritoneal cavity, and contents from the stomach can then go into the peritoneal cavity. Okay, so you can get gastric perforation. Now, this is a medical emergency. Uh, this is very, very life threatening. This is a surgical emergency. You need a surgeon very, very fast if you're going to survive that. Okay, uh, so peptic ulcers can be extremely severe. In addition, long-term peptic ulcers can also go on to cause uh, gastric adenocarcinoma. Okay, so long-term peptic ulcers can lead to uh, this 
tissue basically becoming carcinogenic, okay? So it can lead to uh, gastric adenocarcinoma, and I'm not going to say anything more about that in this video. Okay, right, so we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video what we'll turn our attention to is how do we treat uh, gastric ulcers, okay? Specifically these chronic gastric ulcers, peptic ulcers. Okay, now, um, we are not going to look at how you treat helicobacter pylori infections. Those are clearly treated uh, through antibiotic therapy. Uh, and often you will give the um, drug ciprofloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone. And if you want to find out about that, I have a whole playlist on antibiotics. And if you go and look at the fluoroquinolone videos, then you'll find out about that. Uh, we're going to focus on how we can treat peptic ulcers, how we can treat uh, the overproduction of hydrochloric acid. So we're going to look at drugs which will reduce uh, the hydrochloric acid level within the stomach and therefore hopefully spare the stomach uh, the um, peptic ulcer. Okay, so uh, we'll continue this discussion in the next video.